start there then. Let's, let's read again the, the scriptures in Ephesians 6. <clears throat> let's start from verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on. Say put on. Put on. That means to wear. Put on the whole. Say the whole. The whole. whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the vials of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole hammer of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Say stand. Praise the Lord. That's what we need to do. Stand. Stand therefore. Verse 14. Therefore stand having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Praise God. <clears throat> the armor of God is a beautiful subject. Many books have been written about it and many, many comments made on it. And I think uh, for centuries to come, if the Lord tarries, there will be yet more material uh, brought out in regards to this very important subject. <clears throat> I guess the reason it's so relevant, so important, particularly so in our days, although ever, as long as there have been Christian and believers, is the fact that we are at war. We are at war with the powers of darkness. In the early verses we read there, uh, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. These are not powers or <clears throat> human strength that you can fight with human strength. If that was the case, <clears throat> more than likely, our church service will look a little bit like the Roman arenas where we would be uh, dressed up in gladiator kind of wear and, uh, and uh, we would be learning the skills of physical combat. But that is not the kind of combat or war uh, that this, these scriptures present, of course. It's a spiritual warfare. We are fighting against powers and dark, or darkness, rulers in high places, and these things fight for keeps, don't they? But it is nevertheless, I want you to understand this, in spite of the fact that it isn't a physical bout, it is nevertheless a very, very, very real war. It is a very real combat. And I want you to notice something. We are given <clears throat> an explanation of the armor we must wear, but what is the weaponry by which the enemy attacks us? Have a reading of those verses. What's it say? What kind of weapons does he use from those verses? He uses fiery darts. He doesn't even have to be up close to you to hit you. In the old days when this kind of uh, warfare was obviously commonplace and there were no guns, the next best thing to the gun in a sense of a, of a soldier, a footman, was in fact just that, the archers. The archers would line up and they would all shoot at a certain angle in the, in the sky and you'd think the enemy's there, where are they doing shooting up there? The fact is that the trajectory would be such that by the time it actually arrived at the end, not only it would pick up intense speed, but it would perforate and penetrate and do all sorts of damage on the oncoming armies. Satan is a coward. He doesn't even come up close to fight. He would rather chuck arrows at you, fiery ones to boot, to be able to hit you even at a distance. I'm going to tell you something. You don't have a bow and arrow to fight back with. We do have an armor, however, A, to protect ourselves from such fiery darts and a shield to do the same. And you've been through all the explanation of those things. 
But we have a weapon, and the weapon we're going to discuss today is the sword of the Spirit. Just before I do, however, let me, let me draw your attention to what is at the early portion of verse 17, and that is the helmet of salvation, yet another protective cover. And praise God for this. A helmet, of course, in those days was very much like a, you could call it a skull cap, almost. It was made of steel or metal in any case, sometimes of leather, and it covered the head. All parts of the armor we've seen cover and protect very important aspects of the body, but the helmet covered the head. What's the relevance of this helmet? Why such a, a piece of weaponry, do you think? Why such a, a piece of armor? What's the relevance of it? It coordinates absolutely everything else that happens in your body. So relevant it is that you can be the greatest muscle person, muscle bound, incredible strength, but if there is no brain to control those muscles, it's quite useless. So having, having looked at every other aspect of the armor of God, we realize that this is actually probably one of the most central and important parts because without this protection, the very center, the very uh, center of communication of everything that happens in our bodies and in the spiritual sense, everything that happens in our spiritual life is actually destroyed. And wh what does the Bible equate this helmet with? Think about it. It equates it to this, salvation. Without that salvation, to begin with, it doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter what breastplate you may have on or what preparation you might have. It really is not going to amount to a whole lot. We need somehow this salvation to be ever pertinent and pr prominent or, uh, you know, in our minds. So certainly our thoughts, our thinking, our decision making, all that you've said, perhaps even our eyes and ears which are part of this head we protect has all to do with being alert, aware, and I guess certainly being reminded constantly that we are saved people. Say right now, I am saved. Now let it come in, let it, let, let it sink in. Because if you mean it with your heart, not just your lips, that says an awful lot. I am saved. Say it again with me, will you? I am saved. What are you saying? You're saying that you are standing in a position that God has put you in. You weren't always in this position, that's for sure. We were not always saved. We lived and behaved in ways that you know, certainly were contrary to God. But today, I am saved. I stand saved and that's the position that God has put me in. So clearly, for me to remove that thought, put that helmet aside, to forget who I am in Christ, to remove that helmet and forsake the fact that I am saved in any context. Beautiful, shiny looking breastplate of righteousness, without your salvation, it's worth tuppence, nothing. It helps you naught. You may have all the knowledge and understanding and preparation of the gospel of peace, and I pray you do, but without that helmet of salvation where you are conscious that you are a saved, redeemed individual and you need to live that way, it's worth what? Precious little. Precious little. I had the sad opportunity to hear a man quote scripture. It was quite remarkable. Actually, he was quoting scripture so precisely that it was almost like you, you could read it. This man had obviously taken time at some stage of his life to, to memorize the word. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he was prepared in the gospel of peace. But by way of illustration, it shows that he had taken time to absorb the word of God and be able to recite it quite fluently. But he did so in between drawers on a cigarette and sips on a beer. And he was actually entertaining his mates at the pub. Now, tell me... <clears throat> without salvation, does that suit him anything? Is that going to bless him in any sense? Is it going to prepare him for any battling of any kind whatsoever? You see, Satan will laugh at you and I if we pretend that we have all other preparation, but we forsake to wear, to be conscious of this one fact, I am saved. And you know why I'm saved? Because Jesus saved me. If I forsake that, if I put that aside, if I forget that factor, if my mind somehow isn't good, protected, constantly covered with this beautiful safety, the salvation of God, then somehow I am missing the mark. I am letting myself wide open for the attacks of Satan at every level. There is another way that a war was fought to some degree, <clears throat> and this was a war of the mind. I am told even during uh, the world wars that all too often prisoners 
uh, were to fight a different war that didn't involve weapons. It was actually a battle of the mind. They were uh, somehow uh, taken into rooms and shown almost kindnesses as prisoners in a way of trying to demotivate or change their mindset against the enemy. I'm going to tell you something. Satan is very, very clever. The scripture calls him very subtle, actually, and diabolically so in the sense that he will offer all sorts of things to help you or cause you to remove your salvation status and put it aside, even just for a moment. Now, I'm going to ask you something. We believe that salvation is conditional. Is that correct? You see, the grace of God is unconditional. Calvary is unconditionally open to all men uh, in any sense. And, and it does not depend on us. Salvation initially does not depend on us. We have been offered grace liberally. But once we enter that salvation in God, once we are saved, the scripture then directs us into righteousness and we see that grace is now fulfilled through that righteousness. We have to stay saved. Now if that be so, if that be the case, then it means that every moment of every day I need to remain in that position of I am saved. Is that agreed? Can you see that? Every moment of every day I must make certain that I am saved. It's not a living in fear, by the way. It's, it's living in joy, knowing that God has saved me to begin with and I intend to stay exactly where God has put me. Simply put, it means this. It means not shifting, not moving from the position God put me in. How beautiful. It makes sense, however, that if I even temporarily, even momentarily, choose to remove that helmet of salvation and put it aside, and this is a willing thing that we do sometimes, sadly, and I forget my position in Christ, that I am opening myself up, myself up to a condition where Satan can inflict Injury. Notice the fiery darts. He doesn't even have to be close, saints. He can do it from a distance. And the fact is that we are wise if we never, say never, under any circumstance, in any situation, under any, for any reasons, remove the helmet of salvation. Keep it on your head. Quite clearly the uh, direction of Scripture in this, in this portion of uh, of the writings of Paul to the Ephesians is telling us that we must wear the, the armor, take onto you the armor, and put it on. And uh, this is one portion, certainly along with the others, that must be worn at all times. Anything else that you would like to tell me that is on your mind and heart about this helmet of salvation? What else does it say to you, Brother Brenton? All right, certainly in, the, in that context, if an entry can be made at the mind, all too often it can seep down to the heart, and very quickly so, unless there is a quick turn away from it. Yes, Brother Robert. Yes. That's it. Excellent. Praise the Lord. In fact, this is exactly what our battle is about. In the first place, if we are battling, what are we battling? What is the reason? We're fighting an enemy who is wanting to rob us of our salvation. Isn't that his task? And he will do anything. He will use any ruse. He will try and do anything whatsoever to undermine you and remove from you that salvation by whatever means, by whatever weakness he may find. And so, clearly, it is a battle for our souls, and that is the battle for our salvation. So that helmet is very important, isn't it? I must wear it at all times. I must remind my mind, my heart, my being at all times that I am saved. This is a condition that Jesus has given me, which I should treasure with such high regard, that never, never, not even for an instant, should I forget that. Not even for a moment should I allow my flesh or the devil or anything to help to cause me to put it aside and forget what Jesus has done for me. I am saved is the message of the helmet, a helmet of salvation. Just have a look in the Old Testament for a moment in Isaiah, if you will. The 59th chapter, I believe it is. 
and the 17th verse. And you will see that this concept <clears throat> was well established even amongst the Israelites. For God was indeed their salvation and, uh, and the one that directed them uh, from, from the top, from the head as it were. Verse 17, Isaiah 59 reads this way, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. Praise God. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. The concept of the helmet of salvation was well known even amongst Jewish people long before Calvary. For Jesus indeed, Yahweh, was their salvation. In fact, God presented himself to the Israelites many a times in that very guise of being a savior. The word of salvation in the Hebrew is Oshia, eventually translated Joshua, Yahshua, if you please. Salvation. That's what God was to them, a savior. And again and again, God presents himself as the savior unto Israel. And he is indeed our savior. How do we show this? Well, we wear a helmet. Now look, there are some times where a helmet is going to be uncomfortable. Let's face it. Um, hot day, everyone, the middle of summer, and the heat is uh, beating down kind of pretty hot. That's going to get pretty hot up there, isn't it? Not pleasant. There's also a certain weight implied in a helmet because it's a solid material. And yes, so therefore, the fact that we are saved will mean that there will be some aspect, perhaps, that you may consider a bit of a sacrifice if you choose to see it that way. But when you begin to view, when you begin to reason the value, the benefits associated with that helmet, it doesn't warrant taking it off, not for one moment, not even thinking about it. Praise the Lord. So keep that helmet of salvation on and uh, be sure that uh, you don't give Satan the opportunity um, to attack at that level. For indeed, that level is probably so crucial to every other aspect of our warfare. Okay, let's read on in verse 17 then and progress to the sword of the Spirit. It says, and the sword of the Spirit, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I guess that we could say to date, we have really observed every aspect of this armor and we've seen that each each portion of it is of a defensive nature, protective nature. But here now we have something in our hand that is not just protective in that you can fend off the blows that come at you, but you can actually inflict with it as well. In other words, you can fight and attack with it. And this is the description of the Word of God. It says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, of course, as soon as we say a sword, we envisage all sorts of uh, drawings or pictures on our mind. So that's what I'm meaning, though, is, do you see the sword as, you know, the fencing type sword? You know, thin, round, long, flexible, you know, you know, uh, or do you see that like the old, the old, um, uh, what do you call them, the Crusaders? You know, those big, incredibly long swords. You know, that you, you, used to, you had to be quite a giant in the first place to lift the sword. Never mind to swing it. You know, and uh, when that thing hit, it just chopped. It was just like, you know, get out of the way. And of course, uh, they could keep quite a distance with those swords. Massive, two-handled job, by the way, uh, in most cases. Yeah. Notice the, the kind of armor you've got. You've got a shield in one hand. And so, this is a one-handed sword. I like this. It means that it has to be, well, whichever sort of hand you may want to use. I'm right-handed, so... But it's a one-handed sword. It couldn't be too huge, and neither can it be too small in that sense. And yet, the quality of this sword, interestingly, the very word in this scripture, is, is compared to uh, what they call a dirk, or the Scots call a dirk. A dirk was a, almost like an overgrown knife basically it was actually a broad wide blade and it, it varied in, in, in shape or sorry in, in, uh, in length anywhere from about eight inches to about 20 inches which was about the Roman sword and it usually w- was was handled by a single handle grip just like a knife essentially and uh, this was worn quite openly for everybody to see by the way it was something that they carried quite casually and for everyone to see. Very sharp, double-edged. Yes. See, the kind, of, the kind of weaponry God has given us isn't long-distance range weaponry. We've got to get up close and personal. There are times, saints, in fact, I believe that this is the case in every case. The scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you fight this enemy, 
You're not going to be doing it with a, a bow and arrow or a long sword. You're going to do it with a short sword, a very sharp one, mind you, a double-edged sword, but up close. You will protect yourself with the shield and you will strike with this very powerful weapon, but it needs to be up close. Now, it's interesting that up close, a person can't actually flex a bow and they can't use a long sword. You actually, you actually have the advantage. And I want you to understand this, that becoming versed, well-equipped with the Word of God, you have the advantage over Satan. Jesus showed us this by way of an example. When he was tempted, you remember what he used? The Word of God, up close and personal and very, very sharp. Praise God for that. So you can see that even as it can be seen um, perhaps in history, Romans fighting the Greeks, the, the kind of weaponry was designed for close combat. It's not always pleasant to be that close to what you're doing when it comes to a kill. Face to face, that's right, very good. You couldn't turn your back either, could you? You'd have to be face to face. But the fact is this, we've got to face our enemies and we've got to face that enemy so close that we show him in Jesus' name, we are not afraid of this enemy. Let him be the coward and throw the arrows from afar. But let no saint of God be a coward. Let him face, let her face the enemy close with that weapon that God has given you. You are facing the enemy. You, first of all, can see the arrows coming. And what is the shield of faith for? To quench the fiery darts of the devil. And the only time you're really totally open and vulnerable is if you turn your back and you are going away from the enemy in where not only there's no protection, but you can't really see the fiery darts coming. Brethren, we are equipped to fight a battle, to fight a good fight, to run a good race, the Apostle Paul said. If... If really handled correctly, there should be no time, hear me now, no time when Satan gets the better of us. Because we are equipped to win this victory, to win this battle, to win this fight. Do you think that God would send us into battle unequipped and unable to win? In the very first place, the very reason why this is the kind of weaponry we've been given is because God considers it sufficient to defeat the enemy. So there should be really no time, no reason why we ever end up, as it were, the victim rather than the victors. Firstly, we have been told that Jesus has already overcome Satan and the world. And because of that, we can be overcomers. We are overcomers. And in the second instance, we have been given all the necessities to make sure that we remain strong and spiritually apt to be able to fight this enemy. So you can see that quite clearly, whilst he has to stand back and he's not really equipped to beat the saints, all too often he gets it in for two. He gets his darts in for several reasons. Firstly, because we are not dressed in our armor, we have chosen to put it aside for one reason or another, unwisely so. And or we are not careful of the darts that come at us. Sometimes we even turn our backs, and so we end up victims. When in reality, we should be facing that enemy. All right. Let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. Let's have a look at this description of the sword just to uh, go a little bit deeper on the understanding of its abilities. I want you to understand the power that is in your hand. Remember, God has given you His Spirit and He has dressed you in His armor. And in your hand is a very powerful weapon. Okay, this is Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Somebody read it out loud for me. Who has that? Please, Brother Casey, at the back. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Now let's have a look at, analyze a little bit of the qualities that are, that are given to us in regards to this sword. What is the first thing that is said about this word of God, this sword? It is what? It's quick. Okay. It's quick is in the sense that, yes, it can do a very quick word. But more than that, that word quick in this context means literally life-giving, as in quickening. In other words, when you preach, teach, use the word of God, what happens? You bring in life, aren't you? 
In fact, the scriptures are referred to as the very source of life or the very words of life. Do you remember what Jesus said to the apostles? He said, are you also going to leave me? And he's, they replied, well, where shall we go? Only you have the words of life. Isn't that beautiful? And so the word of God is a word of life. It's quick. It's a quickening word. Speak it and it will give life. Preach it, teach it, share it with somebody and you will find that there is a river of life that will begin to flow because of the Word of God. It's quick. It's a quickening word. Yes. Okay, the second quality given to us and we could comment quite at length. I'm trying very much to make sure that we can complete the study today. What is the second quality given to us there? The Word of God is powerful. Use it, and Jesus did, and that's His example, to put an end to Satan's arguments, that's powerful. It can, it can show the power of it and, and convince a sinner to become a saint of God. Now, that's powerful. That's life-changing power. I mean, that's more powerful than the atomic bomb. It destroys. This, this Word of God builds, edifies. It, it builds again and makes anew. Glory to God. I believe there is a power even greater implied here. And that is in maintaining life. Now, okay, let me, let me show you what I mean here. You and I are parents. We can bring forth a child into the world. I guess that that's powerful when you think about it. And that's wonderful, isn't it? But isn't there a greater power and necessity? Once you've brought that child into the world, you've given them life. But now what do we need to do? Not only maintain that life, but train that life. But that requires even more power and wisdom and glory and absolute amazing qualities, all of which are seen in the Word of God. All of those things are given to us in God's Word. Yes, life-giving and life-maintaining power. So very good. Not only a quickening Word, but a powerful Word. It is the Word of God, once again, that brought all things into existence and are maintained there. The Scripture says this of Christ, all things consist, abide, rest, live by Him. And of us, that our lives are hid in Christ. Cool. How powerful is that? To be able to check to be able to cross-check and to evaluate those things that come our way and to base our belief system, everything that we stand on, on the word of one who knows everything. That's powerful. That's powerful. And so once again, the word of God is not only quick in that it gives life, but also it is powerful. You can't really separate God from His word, right? So when you are wielding the word of God, Think about it. God has really become, as it were, your right hand in that point. You have the power of God. And that's very powerful. Very powerful. Can you see how incredibly strong we can be in God, and yet all too often we run away from the enemy? And we become victims, forgetting our salvation, forgetting the sword that is in our hand. Let's read another quality of this. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharper than any two-edged sword. What does that tell you about the Word of God? We've said that it is quickening, okay, so it gives life. It is powerful in all the ways that we've discussed. Now, we're told that it is sharp, so sharp that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Word of God does exactly that. It chops off some things that don't belong there. It's sharp. But I want you to know it is not a nilly, willy, cut, chop, slash at anything at anyone. It shouldn't ever be used that way because it is such a sharp implement sharp scalpel in the hand of a surgeon that is capable of cutting around the right place where it can save life rather than to take life away. The thing about the Word of God that cuts is that sometimes we're not going to enjoy it. Who enjoys being slashed at, you know, being cut? I don't think there's not any one of us that doesn't repel at the mere thought of being cut, physically I'm talking about. In a spiritual sense, it's somewhat the same. Our first reaction to being cut is that, ooh, no, not, not for me. But really, this cutting is a nece necessary one. It removes that which would otherwise all too often kill us, remove our life from us. I guess that that's an interesting concept. Why do you think it's been compared to a double-edged sword, a two-edged? What, what, what was the advantage of having two edges instead of one on the sword? What would you say? Yeah. It cuts both ways, right? So, in other words, to cut, you didn't have to go one, around, and again. Right? It was, it kind of, it was a double loaded, if you can imagine. It would be able to cut and slash both sides. Now, in that sense, therefore, it is able to cut on both sides. The Word of God is just as important 
and will do the work just as much for the person that he's preaching as much as for the person that is receiving the preaching. Brethren, remember, it's a double-edged sword. What we teach first applies to us. Every concept that we stand for and we abide by and we say to others, this is God's word, you're really saying at the very same time, hey, Max, call your own name out. Right? Me. Me saying it. It's for me. It's the concept that applies to me. It cuts both ways. Very important concept. We must never forget that the word of God is vital, not just for the hearers, but for the preachers as well. That if, if in the physical realm, if in the physical sense, your life depended on a two-foot, broad, double-sided sword, and you each had one, and your life depended on it, this is your weapon of defense, what would you do with that sword? Would you stand it in the corner and hope you never have to use it? What, what, would, be, what would be your attitude towards the sword? Just to carry, what would you say? I think, I, I think you might, wouldn't you? Would you take it out every day and practice with it, do you think? Would you learn to use it so skillfully that it doesn't matter who comes at you, you would be able to at least, at least give them a fair fight. <laughs> that would be your attitude, wouldn't it? You know, over my dead body kind of attitude. If you can imagine this practice taking place, you would know everything about that sword. You'd know how sharp it was. You'd know exactly how to care for it, how to holster it and... Oh, whatever, put it in the scabbard, I think that's what it's called, um, how to draw it out without hurting your own self. Okay? But then you would also do this. There would be such things as friendly combat. Now here is not to kill the other person, but to spy with them, wouldn't you? You, you sort of, okay, let's, let's practice this. If an enemy came at me and they did this, what do I do? Apart from to stand there and tremble and drop my sword. What would you do? And you would practice the movement that would counteract that, that attack. Can you see what we're saying? How many times have you got together with the Word of God and a brother or a sister and you've said exactly that? Let's use the Word of God. And then let's see. How would you answer this question? What would you explain in this situation? What would be your explanation? What are you doing all the while? You're practicing, aren't you? You're practicing the sword. Swordsmanship is so incredibly important that if your life depended on a physical sword, I am sure, I am sure you would make every effort. And by the way, just for the record, uh, in a physical sense in the old days, uh, there were probably just as many women that were capable with swords as there were men that had the opportunity, of course. Although war pertained particularly to, to men, of course, in the spirit sense and in the spirit world, every believer is a warrior. Every believer is a swords person. If you don't want to call a swords man, a swords woman, a swords person, okay, practice your sword. Practice it. Make sure that you know exactly how to wield it. What we want to make with this is the Word of God is most effective when it is delivered in person. When you yourself, anointed of God, are able to use the Word of God. You become the very oracle through whom God speaks and you deliver the Word of God, whether it is in your testimony. In fact, here, let me link it to this. The Scripture says that God has selected what? The foolishness of? Isn't that interesting? That preaching, which is the spoken Word of God, is what God has selected to be most effective in the saving of souls. So, very true, we need to be very close in proximity because of the nature of this. And, of course, uh, this, the kind of sword we have means that it, we need to deliver it in person. Unlike other weapons which were thrown or perhaps uh, cast by a bow or not this sword. You have to hold on to it and you have to personally deliver it, as it were. And so it is with the Word of God. I guess there is one other aspect of this fighting with the sword that I want to kind of raise. Is not only do we, uh, should we... Uh, practice daily, know daily, and, and invest our time in learning the skills of using the Word of God. Uh, but with this attitude, we are to use it only and ever for the purposes it was given to begin with. Please remember that. It was sent to give life. It was sent to be powerful against the enemy. Not against your brother and your sister and your friend. It's sad how many times I have seen the Word of God used not at all with the enemy out there and then to slash a brother or sister to pieces. 
Um, hang on, are we using it for the right reason here? Is this what it was sent to do? I think quite clearly the Word of God was meant to edify us. In fact, it says here that it was really given to pierce, to divide, to actually separate. And notice it is a spiritual sword. So if you're going to fight the enemy, then perhaps it's wise to get to know some of the tactics of the enemy. I, I dare say that um, in any in any confrontational sport, perhaps, um, let's say we're talking any like tennis or what have you, if you know your opponent, you'll know how they play. Who, who plays tennis? You play tennis? I, I'm not a very good player at all, but I've watched. And I can tell after a while that, that this player has learned that this other player's backhand is a little bit weak. They're not so good at the backhand. I think that's that, right? Sort of. So naturally, what is this player going to try to do? Play to the backhand. That's right. At the weak spot. Now, if that's true of us against the enemy, what do you think the enemy is doing at the same time? He's going to study your weaknesses. He's going to see exactly where your weaknesses are in the use of the word, in the use of the weapon. He's going to try and find the holes, the little corners you don't get to, the little things that you leave undone, or perhaps those things that are all too important, but, well, we haven't practiced, so we're weak. And Satan is a formidable enemy, and whilst we have all the weaponry and the power to defeat him, he's also very cunning. So he'll study you. I would suggest that you study him. I don't want you to spend all your time thinking of the enemy. Spend most of your time thinking of Jesus. But don't forget to understand how the enemy works and to find how you can best defeat him. Amen. The sword of the Spirit. Praise God. A lot more we could say on that subject. And uh, as I am intent and I've been asked to make sure we complete the study. So let me go back to Ephesians with you to say that we need to dress all of these things. All this armor that we, we wear, we bear in an attitude which is an attitude of prayer. Have a look at what it says at the end of verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. And then it continues to say, praying always. It's almost like this is the, the very element that will keep it all functional, all correct. Praying, how often? Always. Say always with me. Always. I mean, certainly we can have a morning time of prayer, an evening time of prayer perhaps, but really the attitude that we see from Scripture is to pray without ceasing. Always. Praise God. It's quite true to say that in, in context with the warfare we're talking about, prayer is, is an incredibly amazing weapon and we need to make sure we use it daily, every day. Let, let me show you why Satan hates prayer, however, and why, in fact, I'll go as far as saying he's scared of a saint praying. That's why he will try and stop you praying probably ahead of doing anything else. You see, in, in combat, and I guess that this is one of the things that was most terrifying to the enemy, the noise of the oncoming army was all too often the most demoralizing, the most concerning, and the most frightening of things. When come face to face with an enemy, the shout of an enemy, the clamor of the sword being banged against the shield, not only motivated and, as it were, uh, you know, raise the, the courage and the hope in those that were fighting on this side, but it did quite the opposite on the other side. It made them feel, oh, this is quite a force coming at us. Prayer is a bit like that. It makes such a noise towards heaven of glory, of praising, of thanking, of communication with the Father that it scares the living lights out of Satan himself. And that's why Satan will try and stop you from praying. He will do anything to keep you from getting on your knees and praying before God. He will try to do whatever is in his power to stop this process because he knows that this is the very thing that demoralizes his cause and in fact gives you the courage to wear that armor and to use it against him. Prayer. Prayer, it says here, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I want you to say those three words, please. In the Spirit. Or oh, if I could encapsulate everything that Christian living is, whether we are talking what we speak, what we do, how we pray, how we behave, it would be in these three words. In the Spirit. For we, if we remain in the Spirit, then we know that we're doing that which is led of the Spirit of God. And even our prayer, and specifically our prayer, must be 
in the Spirit. It says, watching thereunto with all perseverance for all the saints and for the leaders. Uh, Paul counted himself amongst them that utterance may be given, you see, to, uh, to make the gospel uh, count for those that were re- being revealed the gospel to or being reached by the gospel. Saints, the prayer is that glorious sound that comes from your soul towards heaven that will have the enemy run away. And all too often, you won't have to get up close and personal with the sword if you've done sufficient praying. You'll still have it there, but the prayer will have already scared the enemy well and truly away. Hallelujah. What a glorious armor we've been given. What great opportunity. Can you see any reason at all why we should ever run scared from the, from the enemy? Is there any reason at all why we should become the victims when in reality God has already set us up to be the, the winners? Do you want to be a winner? Yes. Well, see, God has made you to be on the winning side. He took you from the lose, losing side of sin and, and degradation. He took you from that side and He put you on the winning side. And then He gave you the Holy Spirit power within you and dressed you in an armor with which you can fight the very powers of hell itself. Now, it takes a little bit of courage and work to stand, to practice, and to do what God wants us to do. And here is the words I want to leave you with. It's at the very beginning of this passage. Stand, therefore. Stand. Will you do exactly that this morning? And as you do, please think of what we have studied throughout the series of lessons. <coughs> Directive from God is to stand is to take a stand. Stand for what is right. You will become a target when you stand. You'll be noticeable when you stand. But you are equipped to fight the enemy when you stand. Can you imagine a soldier attempting to fight the enemy sitting down or laying down? He would be immediately disadvantaged. So when you stand, yes, you may well attract the attention of the enemy, but you'll also be in the best possible position to fight and to fight a good fight of faith. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads in prayer and let's ask God to touch us and reveal these things to us today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God.